couple months. And we keep praying for her, and the Lord is working in her life. Yes. She got the doctor she preferred, praise God. He yes. worked it all out. So he's still answering prayer. Yes. Yes. yes, he is, and he always will. And one day, it won't be just a day of refreshing. It will be eternity of refreshing. Yes. Oh, what a day. Praise God. And I want to thank Chani for doing the decorations. And she saw that Marion got here, and she had to leave. And you, most of you know that Marion's had quite a time and major surgery with valve replacement in her heart. And it's taken a while for her to recover from it. But each day she's recovering. And we just praise the Lord for it. And wasn't her stories? Just yes. did they lift you yes. up? Yes. Oh, to hear these stories fresh hand of what God has done. And we've all got those stories. And we need to share those stories with one another. I know I love to be someplace where everybody's talking. You know, it's a casual situation. You don't feel like, oh, I've got to say the right thing. You just talk and you tell the stories. But then a teacher or a pastor or somebody gets up and, anybody got a testimony? <laughs> well, see, from experience, I know we all have yes. testimonies. Yes. Yes. We all do. And we praise the Lord for it. And Lorraine for helping with the food. Helping. Yes. She did uh, the food. Yes. Debbie, Debbie and La Lorraine baked the goodies for Debbie. And yes. Bernice, yes, thank you, Bernice. She kept the coffee going and the tea and kept everything hot, and that was a real big help. Yes. And Sonia, she was a mess, but she helped clean up and whatever. She said, I can't sit still. I said, I'll put you to work. What I said is, I'll put you to work. She said, tell me what to do. And she helped to clean up went really quick. And so now we're going to just turn this over to Debbie and get on with the day. Amen. Okay, time for another drawing. So, okay, why don't you pick their number over here? Okay. Six, eight, six, six. Oh. <laughs> There's more women over on this side. We have one more chance. Five, one more. Four, seven. Oh, good for you. I'm trying to shake them up. You are. You're doing good. You're smart. Are you all comfortable? We turned the air off, so. That's <laughs> fine. My sister's not anxious back there. Oh, I stepped on this side so I could win. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, six, eight, four, nine. <laughs> really? Six, eight, four, nine. Betty Russo. <laughs> so I checked my phone at lunchtime and Sister Nancy posted to me, commented to me, sent me a text and wanted to let y'all know how much she missed being here mm -hmm. and she's hoping and praying that y'all can get refreshed and renewed in the Lord and um, she wishes she could be here and we know she, she's been missing so many Sundays um, and it's really breaking her heart so when you all think about her just lift up her name in prayer and, and um, pray that they find out what's causing the edema for sure um, and God, you know, God sits still in the miracle business, girls. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, we just have to have faith and trust in Him and and just let that devil know He's not going to win. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to introduce right now our next speaker. 
which is Sonia Clark. Ooh. Ooh we love having Sonia. She's a, been a blessing to our, our ladies group for a long time. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you're going to be blessed by her. Um, well, I don't know what she's going to do. Whatever the Lord leads her to do. Okay, you want to sit? Or you can stand, you can, you want. <laughs> you, is that high enough for you? Yeah, low enough for you. Yeah. You, can, you can adjust it. Uh, and all we do, we do for the glory of God, don't we? Yeah. I may be a little nervous up here, but that's public speaking, isn't it? I assure you that um, when Betty asked me, I had no hesitation. We should all be witnessing to one another. But um, I don't have the humor that Mrs. Miller <laughs> surely has. But I do have what the Lord gave me to share with you. Mm -hmm. All right. So he said, start with a joke. <laughs> so a mother went to wake her son up for church one Sunday morning. And she knocks on his door. Get up, she says, and he yells back, I'm not going. And the mother says, why not? He says, I've got two good reasons. They don't like me, and I don't like them. And she replied, well, I've got two reasons why you should go to church. You're no kid. You're 47 years old. And two, you're the pastor. <laughs> One more? Yeah. yeah. All right. So we want to know what the top three reasons are that Eve was created. Oh. And we're going backwards. Number three, God was worried that Adam would frequently get lost in the garden <laughs> because he wouldn't ask for directions, right? Yeah. Number two, God knew that one day Adam would require somebody to help him locate the remote. <laughs> and the number one reason why God created Eve, when God finished the creation of Adam, he stepped back, scratched his head, and said, I can do better than that. <laughs> All right, now you've made me nice and comfortable. <laughs> so who am I? Who am I? I'm one body trying to tell everybody about the somebody who saved my soul. Yes. Amen. Um, I'm Puerto Rican. I was raised in a ghetto in New York City. My mother and father both worked full time and neither one went to church. I had one brother and all we did was fight. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get out of that household. I met my father, my son's father, when I was 13. And I knew that I was going to marry that man. I was 17 when we got married, and my son was born just after I turned 19. And I wasn't going to church, and I wasn't connected. This retreat, as far as uh, Psalm 91, well, I read about it, and it says that it's a psalm a psalm of protection, usually invoked in time of hardship, and it assures us of security and overcoming. And so these words mostly are from the Lord, I assure you. Now in the early 80s, I was experiencing some hardships. I got divorced. I went wild. I had never been with another man, and I thought that's what I was supposed to do. And so I was rebellious and uh, just uh, loose, shall we say. Then I lost my home, I had to move, I was raising my son as a single mom, great model that I was, and I was trying to return to college, unmarried, I let Bob move in with me. And I was just on a very destructive path. But in the book of Ephesians, Paul urges believers to live a life worthy of the calling they have received. I had my calling. I had my dream. I'd always wanted to be a nurse. I was a nurse. I knew of a God, a God, but I didn't know the God. 
And I was raised Catholic. Neither parent went to church, but they made sure we went. But the home and the church were very rigid with all the don'ts. I remember you saying a lot of don't do this and don't do that. And that's what I was raised with. Um, in the third chapter of Colossians, Paul instructs us to put to death whatever belongs to earthly nature. That includes sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. And instead, clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, yes. humility, gentleness. Yes. We're to take off our grave clothes, yes. G-R-A-V-E, and put on our grace clothes, yes. G-R-A-C-E. We are to clothe ourselves with Christ. Mm -hmm. So, here I am a nurse, uh, blessed to be a nursing supervisor, and this was the off shift. And I would, my, my job just entailed, you know, they needed somebody to point the finger at. So I was throughout the whole hospital. Busy Saturday night, and um, some shifts are rougher than others, and a lot of people think people sleep at night, and they don't. <laughs> it can be just as busy. <laughs> she, she said, you're waking us up, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, an emergency room on a Saturday night is chaos, actually. Yeah. There was an admission, very elderly, very ill man, and we were short on beds. So he's going to a certain unit, and the nurses are in a tizzy. They have enough to do. Now we're going to give them one more. They had the bed. But I did what I could as a supervisor. I helped bring him up, I tucked him in, I did all the immediate needs for him. I even did the documentation. They were still in a tizzy. And out of nowhere, my mouth says, don't worry, nothing's going to happen till 7 a.m. The man was a full code, and so he looked like he was going to code, he was that sick. He probably needed to be in critical care. So I say, nothing's going to happen till 7 a.m. By then, the day shift will be there. They'll help, and they'll take over. I go about my business. They do theirs at exactly 7 a.m. A code is called. I knew it before they even broadcasted it. It was that unit and that room. It was that man. So the day shift is there. There's a lot of help but a code goes on for a long time. And everybody got out late. I get out late, and it's Sunday morning, and I tell you, my car goes all by itself, a whole different way than I usually go home. And there's this church, big marquee. Church-going families are the happiest. I wanted to be happy. Mm -hmm. I needed to be happy. And my car just pulls into that parking lot. I also noticed that church service is about to start. I park and I get out. Oh my goodness. The entrance to that church, everybody in their Sunday finest, everybody hugging, everybody welcoming me. I felt like I'd come home. I remember, I don't know how my seat was selected, but I remember sitting dead center. And when the sermon was going on, it was right at me. And when the pastor at the end, he didn't do an altar call. He said, from your seat, repent, say the salvation prayer. And I cried out to God, and I did. And I want to tell you that it doesn't matter where you've been, who you're sleeping with, what you're drinking or smoking, what you think, who you've hurt, the games you're playing, the masks you're wearing, the agendas that you're uh, hiding, or whether you ever get better or not. When you give it all to Jesus, you are saved, you are yes. forgiven, yeah. and you move forward only. Yeah. Matthew 11, 8, 11, 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I felt weary. I felt very burdened, 
but by his wounds and his shed blood, I got saved. Now, what does saved mean? And there are many definitions. To me, at that particular time, it was to be rescued from something undesirable, the lifestyle that I was living. The disciples called Jesus rabbi, and rabbi means teacher. Well, we should call him teacher too. He's waiting to teach us. He teaches us how to live, how to love, how to believe, and how to trust. He guides us with grace and mercy. He mentors us in the ways of love. He has answers for our questions and heavenly wisdom for us to tap into. There is so much to learn from Jesus, a lifetime, and we will continue to learn until we see him face to face. Amen. Psalm 116 verses one and two. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cries for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. I have a renewed mind and a transformed life with love as my central focus, Christ-like love. Psalm 32, 15 says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. As the architect of our lives, God has eternal plans for us. I've been enjoying a wonderful, blessed, and joyful life ever since surrendering to God. Uh, 35 years now married to that man I let live in. <laughs> and I prayed and I prayed and he is saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. We've lived in uh, multiple states having that adventure. We've traveled in and out of this country many times. And this past January, I was able to retire after 42 years of nursing. Wow. And I want to say half of them were in hospice. And I got to see many people give their lives to God at the end of life. Mm -hmm. God Amen. used me. <laughs> yes. Amen. So aside from all the blessings, though, God has fought my battles. Yes. I have had my share of trials. But I try to view them from God's perspective. There's always something to be learned when we think of it that way. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Walking in the Spirit doesn't mean life will be easy. But we never have to walk it alone. Amen. Because our helper is always with us. Amen. So, in closing, anyone who turns to Christ in repentance and in faith is set free. Amen. Every day of a believer's life is lived in the presence of Christ through his Holy Spirit. He comforts during hardships, encourages during difficulty, and strengthens in times of weakness. The benefits of a relationship with God are not postponed until heaven. Right. We walk with him now and always. Yes. Let us often and always repeat Psalm 44, 8. My constant boast is God. I can never thank him enough. Amen, Amen and hallelujah. <laughs> Sonia, that's a wonderful testimony. Amen. How many can relate? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Well, ladies, we're entering into the afternoon, and your bellies are full, <laughs> and you want to take a nap. <laughs> it's like, oh yes, I could take a nap now. <laughs> If we were home, we'd be taking a nap, right? Yeah. Okay. All righty. We have come into this house. Yes. We're on the second set. 
If you feel like standing, stand. What did you come into the house of the Lord to do today? Be refreshed. We've come to worship Him, haven't we? Yes. Alrighty. We have come into this house. Yeah. 
hands in worship as we lift your holy name. For you are great, you miracle so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. For you
beautiful beyond description
that your Holy Spirit just fall in this place. Father, that you just fill us afresh and anew today. That you fill us up to overflowing so that you can mold us, that you can make us, you can fill us, and you can use us, so oh Lord, how you desire, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to your name. Let's sing that one more time, ladies. Sing it from your heart. Hallelujah. find myself, I found myself every time at the front Amen. with my hands honest to God, I am not lying Amen. reached as high as I could mm -hmm. say Jesus use me use me Jesus yes. and then when I answered the call of the preach I thought oh God what have I done <laughs> something to show you that my sister-in-law many years ago did this for us. You must pay the rent. <laughs> I can't pay the rent. Yeah. You must pay the rent. Right. I can't pay the rent. <laughs> I'll pay the rent. Yes. My hero. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I just happened to have this in my hand <laughs> I gotta share that. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't even feel like I need to do anything. I, there's so much to be done. Oh, it's sad. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You know, we sing that chorus. I gave him Amen. my old tattered garment. Amen. And he gave me a robe of pure white. Now, I was 20, I was 12 years old when I went to an altar in Fort Worth, Texas. Amen. Didn't live there at that time, but we'd go down and visit my dad's family every Christmas. And I always had a desire for God. Mm -hmm. And we had one Bible in our house, and the only pages that were white was the book of John. I might be by myself in the house, and I would start reading John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, yes. and on and on and on. Yes. And then finally I just closed it, because I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. It was all Greek to me. Right. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. But those words, you see, the Peter says we're born again yes. by the incorruptible seed yes. of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, my mother, I had such a fear that I was going to die in the middle of the night and go to hell before I was saved because I was under so much conviction. Mm -hmm. And 
This was after the 12 incident. But I was as serious at 12 years old as I was at 20 when God baptized me in the Holy Ghost. Amen. I didn't think I was saved, but I look back on my life, I think I was, I would have gone to heaven, I believe, if I'd have died. Because I had these standards for my own life. Nobody gave them to me, nobody taught them to me, because I'd go to church when we lived in town so I could walk to church, Baptist church. We had three churches in the little Lakeview, Texas, where I was raised, was a Methodist, a Baptist, and a Church of Christ. And I would go to the Baptist most of the time. My sister went to the Methodist most of her life there in Lakeview. But I just, this hunger, and I couldn't Amen. be satisfied. Amen. There in Lakeview, after the, I was 12, I was like, right before we moved to Wilcox, about 14 years old, and they had a revival at the First Baptist Church, and I went every night. They had a Vesper service with young people, and, and they were all, the kids were preaching and testifying, and I was scared out of my wits. I thought, if they call on me mm -hmm. to pray, I will die on the spot. <laughs> because I, you don't believe, nobody believes this, but I was very timid <laughs> growing up. I was scholastic and I was athletic. And that's what I poured my life into because I just didn't say much to anybody, really. I had friends, but not, you know, just anybody I couldn't just talk to. But that night when I finally, and I was going to say the, this thing about dying in the middle of the and I told the people one night, I was healthy as a horse. I said, how we're healthy that is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> According to the horse, I guess. But I, was, <laughs> I had this awful fear. And, uh, but when I was growing up, I had a younger sister. Who was that about their siblings fighting? Their, was it you? You and your brother, was it? Sibling rivalry, you know. We played together and we fought, you know, but we'd just be right back, you know. But she was two years younger than me. And we had this thing of calling each other. Well, my sister would call me, a, Sharon, would call me an idiot brain fool. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother was such a, a psychologist. She just knew the words to say. One day she says to my sister, Sharon, do you know what that means? And her eyes would sparkle. No, I don't. It means she's very smart. <laughs> so she never called me that again. <laughs> but we would call, I don't care where my mother was. She could be outside, she could, I don't know, wherever she was. We'd call each other a fool. Why, I don't know. Out of the recesses of wherever my mother was, it sounded like the voice of God. Whosoever calls his brother a fool is in the danger is in danger of hell fire. <laughs> Do you wonder why I fear hell so much? <laughs> well, when we sing "Twas Grace That Taught My Heart to Fear," and Grace, my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour that I first? You know, there's so much that I could say today. It's awful. I only have this little space. Something has stored in me forever. Hallelujah. But anyway, I'm going to sing. Can I sing? Yes. I, th I think that's all I need to do because we've had so much good pot on us. What are you playing first, darling? I'm going to do all Turn it up. Turn it up. I'll pick it up. I hope. I'm glad to see people making a few mistakes up here this morning. That makes me feel better this afternoon. She, she makes a face. Yeah. I'll forget what key I'm in when I'm playing the piano. Now, what key was I in? And I have to hunt it again. So I'm going to sing a couple of upbeat songs, and then I'll slow down. Because y'all need to lighten up here. And I'm getting wake up. In the name of Jesus. It's a little... Are y'all happy this afternoon? Yeah. Are you too full? I'm too full. Yeah, but that makes me happy. Where's the sweets? Shame on you, Charlotte, for having so many sweets. Where is she? But it's gonna play. I know it is. Let me tell you a story. It's one I love to tell. 
tail from the Bible poets I was thrown in jail. Oh, even in that prison, they knew someone was there. So they never gave up, no, they never gave up on God. They said, we'll just chalk the praise in. When we do it once, we'll do it again. Keep on praising till the shackles fall off. Keep on praising till the shackles fall off. Praise Him in the midnight hour. Praise Him for His awesome power. Praise Him when your heart is broken. Praise Him till the prison doors open. Just when you think, just when you think you worship Him enough. Keep on praise until the shackles fall off. Keep on praise until the shackles fall off. I need this lady up here with me. She's sitting with me. Hallelujah. If your life seems hopeless and everything's gone wrong and you're locked up in a prison of your own. get worse than this. Wow. You know, I kind of tell people that because I'm, I'm not nearly as animated as I used to be because I'm too old to be that <laughs> <laughs> animated. But uh, this pastor that I was preaching at his church, well, you sure did mess up some, something. My theology, I don't know what he called it because he told the people that he was nude. I said, the Bible, I said to her in the back seat, I said, that's not what the Bible said. Mm -hmm. Put on a linen ephod. What Michael despised was him getting down with those lowly, and he's the king. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, humility, I told the girls a while ago, I'm going to write a book on humility and how I attained it. <laughs> uh, I feel free in this place. <laughs> I think y'all can take it. <laughs> Some of these men at church, they just don't know what to do with me. <laughs> take it. All right. Okay, one more. Fast one. If we can get her going. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, she drinks some black coffee. Yeah. 
darkness home. When the doctor shook his head and said, she's gone. You could feel the mother's heart right. You could hear them cry and mourn. Their little girl was only 12 years old. the distance, outlined against the sun, came a man with a mission from the throne. They said, look, somebody's coming, but what they did not know, it was a cross coming down that dusty road. Last August, I broke my foot at a funeral. 
<laughs> stepped off of the platform where I put my Bible and stuff up on the little podium, and my foot turned because I have skinny ankles and they're not real strong, I guess. And I shoot, and my whole weight fell on that foot, and I've had trouble with it ever since. January, I had surgery on it because it wasn't healed. And then back the latter part of June, my husband had a total, uh, he was totally dehydrated, ended up in the hospital for two weeks, in rehab for almost two weeks. And, uh, but he's doing great. He's with me uh, at the motel. Uh, I think Brother Dan was going to go and, and uh, be hospitable and take him to lunch. And I appreciate that. Listen, I... I just appreciate being able to come and do this. I mean, this is just such a blessing. I needed this. I needed this. I just feel like I'm letting my hair down. I just, I just got most of it cut off. <laughs> this is the first time in a long time that I've had it this short, but I'm kind of liking it. We like it. That's just two hard songs to sing when your stomach is as full as mine. Because we just ate a little while ago and then ate again, you know. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to sing a slow one now. That's, that's become one of my favorite ones. How many of you have seen the poster with Jesus on the cross and the caption, I asked Jesus how much he loved me. Yes. And he opened his arms and yes. died. Yes. I heard this on serious radio because that's the way I can learn new songs because I'm on in Latin. In Latin. Yeah. In Latin. So I got to, because some of my people, we all just sing the same song. So I stood up when I knew I was going to do that. Hold your horses. <laughs> for my car because all these newer cars don't have CD players. That's where I practice. I'm so aggravated. But anyway. <laughs> Y'all got me off my subject now. What was I talking about? <laughs> oh yeah. So I stood up before the congregation. I said, look, all of you, this song I'm going to learn. I love you this much. Don't any of you get it because it's my song. <laughs> and this is it. I love you this much. <laughs> Now you get it going. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get it on the right one. Yeah. If you get the wrong one, it's not going to be my key, and I'm going to have a hard time. <laughs> As a child, I ask my mother, how much do you love me? Then she threw her arms wide open for my little eyes to see. Then she told me of the Savior. On a hill so far away When I heard how much he loved me My life has never been the same I love you this much Then he
We've heard the story. We memorized John 3.16. Oh, but sometimes we take for granted how he died for you and me. When our hearts, they should be thankful for the price he paid for. see why I was tired all the time. Couldn't be because I'm 81, I know. <laughs> I'm a pastor of church. But um, anyway, the last, I was here there just recently. He kept asking me, uh, well, how, are you having a hard time breathing? Uh, and all that kind of stuff. And I told the people, I said, I'm going to invite him over to church. <laughs> so he sees I have a hard time breathing. <sighs> but on a full stomach, that's a little hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been wrestling between a couple of things that I felt like that I wanted to share. I'll just briefly mention one about uh, have you settled? You know, a lot of people settle in their lives for things that they shouldn't settle for. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Had someone tell me one time, well, my husband sat me down and told me, I'm not going to go. Don't ask me to go to that Pentecostal church because I'm not going. And you know what? She settled for that. She lived a lifetime, loving husband. They both love each other. She spent a lifetime going to church by herself. Mm -hmm. I got saved. My husband didn't know anything about the things of God at all. And raising a good family. Uh, in fact, one Christmas, is before I got in church and got the Holy Ghost, his sister said, well, we don't have to go to church to be a Christian, do we? And I, I'm not in church. And her mother said, no, you know, you just be a good person. And I just piped up. Well, I don't think it would hurt any of us to go to church. 
I never got that opportunity after I got to church. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Isn't, but I got it in the end. Hallelujah. Yes. I felt that way, you know. We need, we, I knew I needed to be in church. Oh, yes. I lived 16 miles out in the country, 8 miles up. It was dirt road. And I got filled with the Holy Ghost there in Sunray, Texas, and I went home. I had to look up the Assembly of God Church. I wasn't sure where it was, but I found it. And that was, the re this is the rest of the story. Mm. <laughs> I have a desire to go to Sunray, Texas. Never had it before, and I've had to talk to the pastor there. There's not very many left in the church there, but when I, I was about nine months later, when it's about 30-something Medfords, that's my mom's side of the family, got saved in that church in one revival. Mm -hmm. I was a product nine months later. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot to that, but I won't say all that. But <laughs> that led up to that. But uh, my uncle had said he lost his 16-year-old son in a very freaky accident. It wasn't shouldn't have happened. And they weren't speeding or anything like that. But he told the Lord, if one person can get saved from Sherman's death, mm. it'll make it easier for me. Yes. And I was the one. Wow. I want to go back to Sunray. It was a Wednesday night church service. You know, people think nothing can happen on Wednesday. It wasn't a revival. Mm -hmm. The pastor's wife preached. I couldn't tell you what she preached. And my uncle, the night before, one of my uncles had set up till 2 o'clock in the morning with me. I poured out my heart. Because mm -hmm. I would never talk to anybody about what was going on inside of me. And I made a statement. I said, well, I'm going to church tomorrow night, and I know what I want, and I'm going to get it. Now, to this day, I don't know what clicked. I don't know what hit me that I knew. I went to church that next time. I was just waiting for the altar call. Mm -hmm. They didn't have an altar call. So I turned to my aunt sitting beside me. Will you go to the altar with Mom and I? Because she was crying. She was raising pity calls. She knew what it was about. So we did. In about a few minutes, I'm laying flat on my back speaking in tongues. Wow. I was so hungry. I remember what I said when that, because you see the Baptist people, they know how to get you to the altar. Mm -hmm. Just as I am right. with I mean, Holy Ghost conviction come all over me when that sick. But I would hold on to my pew because I had done that at 12. And all those people that would went forward were all dry. I, I'm singing, I mean, I'm crying at the pew. So I'm not going up there. And make an, an idiot out of myself. So I didn't. But you know, God had a hand in that. Yes. Yes. Because if I'd have gotten involved in the Baptist church, I would have never been able to preach the gospel properly. Mm -hmm. Unless somewhere along the line I got the Holy Ghost and, and my eyes were open. Reminds me of a story a little boy had a bunch of little puppies. The pastor was walking down the street, the Baptist pastor. He said, Well, son, what kind of puppies are those? He said, Well, they're Baptist puppies. I thought that was so cute. So he had his speaker come a few weeks later. He said, I want to show you something. So he took him down the street, and there was a little boy playing with his puppies. He said, son, what kind of puppies are those? He said, oh, they're Pentecostal. <laughs> I thought you said they were Baptist. Oh, that was before they got their eyes open. <laughs> but God's best for you. Amen. My son went 31 years before he got saved. But I never gave up, and I never gave up on my husband. Amen. I just hear, the, you know, Isaiah says, hear a little of their love. He said, I just put little nuggets in him when I could. When I knew the, that he was breaking, I started asking him to pray over our food at home. Amen. And he did it. Right then I knew. And he's in it as deep as I am. Hallelujah. God filled the Holy Ghost. We went in the ministry when I was full-time ministry at 25. Was, no, well, preaching revivals. And then at 29, I went to El Mirage to pastor. And then here and there and everywhere. <laughs> Not really. I mean, we, we preached a lot of places while we were on the field, preaching revivals, Cottonwood, uh, everywhere. I've been to the Philippines, and I've preached, and I've been to... Uh, Africa, uh, been to Belize. The only way I've been a world traveler is because I got asked to go there to preach. Yes. One of the greatest times I had, uh, the WM president leader in Hawaii asked me to come and my three girls to come and do the worship. We had heaven on earth, I'm telling you. So when we get through that first, that last night, uh, they all wanted our autograph. They all wanted our picture, you know. We were celebrities. And we get on the airplane, and I look at the girls. 
I said, now girls, welcome back to the real world. <laughs> so don't settle because somebody tells you something like that. She settled. If that had been anything but me, it would have made me pray harder. Because I'm telling you, prayer will Amen. break and destroy. I don't care what the fight is. Amen. Keep on praying and praising the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And when my son got saved, oh, what a day that was. Amen. He lost his little wife. I probably told you that the last time to cancer a few years ago. And last year sometime, I, finally I asked him, son, he was, you know, he's just turned 63 a few days ago. I said, do you think he'll ever get married again? Because I worried about him, you know, being alone and having to fix his own meals and all that. <laughs> and he kind of, mm. then he said, I don't even have a girlfriend. I said, well, that probably won't be too difficult. <laughs> and, but I wanted the right one. I began to pray Amen. earnestly. Amen. God, bring my wife the right one. Yes. Well, he called me later that year, the end of last year, and he had had a little physical problem, and I prayed for him over the phone. And he said, wait, Mama, I've got something else to tell you. Oh, okay. I, is how he put it, I met a lady that lights my world. Oh. I used it in the marriage ceremony because I thought it was so good. <laughs> And she told me, and I, I told her this the other day because she had said something. I said, well, my son told me you were very low maintenance. <laughs> she's a farm girl. She's not, she's not flashy in any way. Just a plain little girl. She, he worked for her daddy when he was about 19, but he didn't know her then. Because he left. We, we left uh, the church in Elmrods, went on the field for two years with the three girls. and He would graduated out of high school and he went back to Wilcox. has been there ever since. But God had spoken to me about Psalm 91. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And I thought about it and gave it some thought. I have to keep this close to me. My mouth is very dry. I, just so I don't, I'm not a dry preacher. <laughs> but I remember some years ago just dissecting this 91st Psalm. And I love it read a book about it just recently, a whole book that someone put out about the 91st Psalm. And since it came up so much this afternoon and today, I thought, well, let's just look at Psalm 91. We read it. I memorized it one time, but I, I couldn't quote it now. But at one point in time, I had it memorized. So get your Bibles, or if you've got a smartphone and you want to look it up on your phone, Psalm 91. And it's on your bookmark. I had a hard time reading it with the color behind it, but... Most of you probably can quote much of it, or if not all of it. Did any of you ever memorize the 91st Psalm? Maybe some of you did. I did, but I've lost it. Now, isn't that amazing? Because when I was a kid, I learned a poem. I can still quote it. Y'all want to hear it? Yeah. <laughs> a little peach in the orchard grew. A little peach of emerald hue, warm by the sun, wet by the dew. Dew it grew. One day while passing that orchard through the little peach, dawned on the view of Johnny Jones and his sister Sue, them too. Up at the peach, a stone they threw down to the ground from which it grew, down from the tree on which it grew, fell that peach of emerald hue hard too. John took a bite and Sue a chew, and then the trouble began to brew. Trouble the doctors couldn't subdue. Too true. Under the turf where the daisies grow. Grew, they painted John and his sister Sue, and their little hearts to the angels flew. Boo, hoo. <laughs> now why do I? <laughs> why can I? How can I remember that? And not to do with the 91st. <laughs> really? I mean, think about it. You know, the Bible tells me that laughter is like medicine. Refreshing, there's nothing more refreshing than laughter. Yeah. Laughter doeth good like a medicine. Yeah. So we, let's let's get serious now. Maybe. <laughs> now someone read this out of the New King James and I kind of I was at one place preaching, they said, Well that don't sound like my Bible, because in place of thee I'll say 
you or you know, I change it as I go along to make it more modern. He that dwells, not dwelleth, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now when you speak of the word dwelling, it means, honey, you're living there. Yes. You say, well, how can we live in that secret place all the time? You know, it's amazing. Have you ever encountered something that somebody's saying something to you and you don't know how, and in your mind you're praying. While they're speaking to you, you're praying, oh God, you know, I need an answer. What, what? The secret place is not secret because you can't find it. It's secret because it's your personal place. God has a place for each one of us and I'm sorry you can't come to my place. I can't go to your place because it's reserved for you. It's reserved for me. And we dwell there in that secret place. You know, me and God, we, we've shared secrets that nobody else knows anything about. And some of them I wouldn't want anyone else to know anything about. Hello. hello. Now listen, I tell my congregation all the time, I don't see no halos over anybody's head in here. <laughs> but He knows us. And our secrets are safe with Him. He doesn't talk about anybody. He doesn't back by. He doesn't accuse us. The devil is our accuser. Not God. But if we dwell in that secret place, if we know that there's a place that we can run this, the psalmist said, lead me to that rock that is higher than I. That, that place that we are. Well, to me, it's our position in God. Amen. That's where we belong. We belong in that secret place with God. Amen. We don't belong in the rubble of this world. But we belong in that secret place. And he said, you'll abide. Abide means ever. Mm -hmm. Abiding is constant. Abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. I don't want to get out from under His shadow. Amen. That's my position in God. Yes. He put me there. Mm -hmm. Ephesians, Paul says that we're made to sit in heavenly places in Jesus. So we have a place that is just for us, for me, Amen. for you. Amen. And he's, that's our position in Him. See, sometimes we forget who we are and what we have. Yeah. We're not some riffraff out there wandering around, wondering about the next day or whatever. But we are children of the Most High God. We are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Peter says, you're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. I said if people could buy eternal life, there's probably not a person on this earth that wouldn't take out a loan to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't cost you anything but your life. I heard someone talking about giving up their fun. That was my thing. You know, I thought I'd be a Christian. That's the end of life. I just began to live. Amen. I went and visited my friends. I was young, 17 years old. I was the young kid on the block, so to speak. All the farmers' wives, we'd have coffee together, two of my friends and myself. And I couldn't wait till I got home after getting the Holy Ghost. They just don't know about this. I became a flaming evangelist. <laughs> I had to tell them. Well, one of the ladies I didn't realize, she knew more than I knew she knew. And the other one said, Well, I know I got one foot in hell. And the other one, she wasn't convicted at all. But I just, and this one lady said, Oh, surely. You're so young. You could be out dancing and partying. And I know my mouth dropped. By the way, I want to thank my two ladies for coming. Kathy and Shirley. Shirley's my secretary treasurer of our ministry. And Kathy, I told her, you're my private secretary. I give you that, that title whether you want it or not. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps up after me. <laughs> because somebody has to uh, keep me straight. But uh, anyway... Uh, yeah, there I go again. <laughs> but we're special yes. to the Father. I sang a little song to someone a while ago. You're so special to your Father. He knows your name and address and He's ordered the best for you. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Amen. So when we're put there, sometimes we, maybe we 
are not quite under that shadow. And we have a convictor. He's called the Holy Ghost. Amen. And He woos us back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Gently. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. But that's our position. Mm -hmm. Recognize your position. Yes. We're just not of this world. Mm -hmm. Jesus prayed for the church. He said, Father, they're in the world, but they're not all of the world. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, in some of our churches, I'm not real sure anymore. That's right. Yeah. I just don't know. But we need to pray for them. We need Amen. to pray for our young people. Yes. We need to pray for them. And then he says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God. Aren't you glad you can say He's my God? Yes. yes. There was a time I couldn't say that. There was a time you couldn't say that. But when the revelation of Jesus... You see, that's what needs to happen today in our altar. We don't have altars per se. But it's just, it's just verbal consent. And, and we read in Acts there, repent, be converted, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Mm -hmm. There has to be repentance. And Paul said, I didn't learn it from man, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to have Jesus revealed to them yes. in the innermost part of their hearts. Amen. Yes. I'm going to read some more scriptures before I talk about this part. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. Can you picture God with feathers <laughs> and wings? Amazing. Because we have our ideas of what God looks like. You know? We're all going to be so shocked, <laughs> including myself. Oh. Under his wings you shall trust his truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night. I remember as a kid having to go out in the dark. My daddy would say, oh, don't worry about it. When it comes to daylight, they'll turn you loose. <laughs> great comfort. Great comfort. But I thank God, sister, I thank God. I, these two ladies that were at church last night, the one that spoke and her sister, they got saved at Lighthouse in its early years when I pastored Lighthouse. And I call them trophies of grace. Because, and somebody used, was it you used the word heathen? Somebody used that word. And that's what she kept saying. We were heathens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but God saved them. But you know, he that is forgiven much, yes. loveth yes. much. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it, it shall not come nigh thee. Mm -hmm. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord. You have made them. See, we... Some teach, you know, you can't be unsaved once you're saved. But we have a will. Yes. We can either will to stay close to God or to walk away from God. We have a man in our church right now in 1967 got saved in a revival we preached for Brother Leroy Owens. I was new in the ministry. And what brought him to the altar, I was Johnny and I were singing, Jesus, sign my pardon. This I surely know. And he came to the altar. Well, he stayed with God. I don't know how long. But for about, he said, 50 years. At least 40 he's been out of church. Mm -hmm. And he's come back to the Lord. And him and he, well, his wife kind of instigated it. She said, well, I've given you the first 30, however many years it was, or 50, so I don't know. But I'm taking the next ones. And I'm going to church. We are going to church. Yes. So at first he would say, I'm just the chauffeur <coughs> and he's sitting in the back you know and little by little by little by little and he's finally learned of the grace of god he was raised in a, a, a denomination i guess you call it that that uh very strict and all the kids are they're just kind of warped because mm -hmm. they think they got to be perfect yeah. <laughs> i told his sister one time i said i want to tell you something the church is for the perfecting of the saints, not perfect saints. Yes. None of us are perfect. Mm -hmm. Paul said, I haven't already attained. I'm not perfect, but I press on yes. toward the mark. Yes. I think when we're perfected, he'll just take us on to glory. Yes. 
So when I die, I say, well, she got perfect. <laughs> Oh, I don't preach like this at home. <laughs> so I'm feeling it. I'm having fun. I'm sure that. <laughs> this chair is not comfortable. I keep trying to get my back off of that back right there. But I need to sit down. What? Yeah, you got one? That'd be awesome. Am I going to take you? No, you don't have one. <laughs> you got a soft chair. Glory. Oh. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation. See, there we go again, habitation. Mm -hmm. Habitation means you're living there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. You're there. You Don't expect this in the morning. <laughs> so get it all out today. Because <laughs> I have to be serious tomorrow. <laughs> I probably will be, but that's just, <laughs> I just feel like I'm at home. <laughs> because it feels like home. Isn't this a beautiful place? Yes. yes. We're Charlotte. Charlotte, thank you. Oh, my goodness. I was so happy that I got invited back. I may never again. <laughs> I'm enjoying it while I'm here. <laughs> oh, they put us in a beautiful motel. We're just doing well. I'm so sorry for your little pastor's wife. Yes, uh, yes. Just continue to pray for her because oh, God answers yes. prayer. Yes. Yes. You've seen some miracles and you have to yes. in the church from time to time. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Amen. They will bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. There's a lot in those verses, but it all has to do with our protection. Yes. Mm -hmm. My husband and I, a few years before we started this ministry, which in April, this ministry will be seven years old, uh, this coming April, that we're in right now, the Revival Worship Center. And we'd gone, made a long trip to Texas. I made a loop. Are you cold, darling? Me? No, she's cold. Yeah. I'm sorry. Maybe you better find another chair. Come up here and help me preach, honey. You'll warm up if you'll come help me preach. I'm warm. I'm never going to get through this. Uh, and anyway, we, were, we made like a 3,000 mile trip. We just made a loop of Texas preaching. Amarillo, Fort Worth, and down to Corpus Christi. And when we were coming home, we came from Corpus Christi to Wilcox in one day. But we gained a couple of hours, which helped us. And we got into El Paso, and I, I started driving back Van Horn or somewhere back there. And I said, well, I want to get through uh, El Paso before we stop, because I don't want to fight traffic in the morning through El Paso. I've been there when it's been like that. So we got through. There was a moonlit night, bright and shiny, and I said, I think I'll just keep driving because I'm a night owl. So I called my sister in Wilcox. I said, Helen, we're going to be at your house about 11 o'clock. I know she stays up late, so I wasn't worried about it. Just have a bed ready for us and be awake or leave the door open or something. Food. And we'll be there. I didn't need food. Oh. <laughs> I needed <to> rest. <laughs> so anyway, we did, and we stayed all night there. So I told my husband the next morning, I said, well, you can drive now since I drove so much yesterday. Give me a rest. Well, we stopped middle ways where we normally stop. It's on the Indian Reservation. There's a big uh, gas station there, so we usually stop there. And we come out. When we came out, I said, oh, just let me drive on in because he doesn't like to drive in the traffic. I said, let me just drive us on home because I, I was rested. We get to that I don't know if you've been from Phoenix to Tucson, but the rest area there, where that rest area is, we're driving, I'm driving 75 to 80 miles an hour. That's where I usually keep it. There's a big van, or a van in front of us. There's all kinds of traffic behind us. And all of a sudden, this tow truck, out of control, comes through the bushes, because there's bushes between the two highways. Oh, my goodness. Breakneck speed, totally out of control, coming right 
at us. And all I could do, I was had my hands on, nowhere to go. I said, just like this, oh God, oh God, oh God. And he swerved and went back, I guess across the median. We never heard him crash. He threw gravel and dirt all over the car. The van in front of us said he clipped him. I got a little teary. I, I asked my husband, I said, did that scare you? He said, well, it just happened so fast. Yeah. It was like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him, and I said, well, I guess God's not through with us yet. Yeah. And it was right after that we started the Revival Worship Center. Wow. Wow. But I said, Johnny, mm -hmm. an angel of the Lord, took charge. Yes. And I said, all these people around us, whether they're saved or not, does not realize that angels, right. maybe yes. more than one, came to our rescue. Yes. Because he was coming right at us. Wow. And I don't, it's only God, an angel of the Lord. Because his angels, he says right here, he, they keep watch over us. Yes. We don't give angels enough credit. That's true. You know, to realize that they, whether the ministers of those of us that are saved. They go at Jesus' command. No doubt he said, okay, go down there. You see what's about to happen. Take care of it. Amen. Hallelujah. We have protection. Yes. All kinds of protection. Yes. He says, all the pestilences. And, and we don't know what we're facing in America. That's right. We don't know what's going to happen the next day. Because things are crazy. Yes. I thought about it. We've got a divided house here. Did y'all know that? Yes. Here, here. <laughs> but they keep talking about how divided America is. They don't understand what the Bible says about a divided house. Yes. A house that is divided will fall. Yes, amen. And I've told our people, God. if Jesus doesn't come right away, America's headed for a fall. True. You cannot treat God, and you cannot delve into the things that kids aren't even taught that they have a gender. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's awful. It is. I mean, you just wonder how much worse it could get. And guess what? It gets worse. Yes, it does. It does. We don't know how far it's going to go. But I know that, it, you know, I remember years ago, out of the mouth of Billy Graham, many years ago, he said, if God, Jesus doesn't come soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Did y'all ever remember him saying yes. that? I well remember. Yes. And look what it is now. Yes. I mean, there's, there's no depth to what people will do. I mean, we had a, our organist who was tremendous organist. Played black style, any style. He was our choir director. And he played the organ. And he could feed me any song, new or old. If I, like I did a while ago, he'd feed it to me. But he went into the gay lifestyle. Oh. And Sister uh, Dor Dottie Rambo was with us one time in our church at Lighthouse. And she said, surely you'd be shocked to know how many homosexuals are sitting on our organ benches today. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, recently I found him on the, on the Facebook. I had to take him off. I really believe that God has turned him over to a reprobate mind. Oh, wow. Because the things he said about God mm -hmm. and the Bible and Christians mm -hmm. would curdle your blood. Mm -hmm. It's like, I can't do this. I can't, I can't do this. i got to leave that cord down because I'm making lots of noise. But all of this, there was a lady, she was taking me down. I was assistant pastor of the church for a while in, in uh, Tolleson and she had folks down there. We were having a women's meeting. She come by and picked me up, and she said, "Well, Sister Kimsey, what are you doing about storing food?" <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you know, in case something happens, I'm kind of figure, trying to figure out now. If you have this food, most of it has to be hydrated, doesn't it? Yeah. Cooked some way. Yeah. Well, how are you going to do all that if everything's blown up? Yeah. And I looked at her. I said, well, "You know." I said, I never thought about it. Of course, there's a man making millions. Right? Yes. And you know who I'm talking about. I said, you know, my Bible 
I don't see that in the Bible. I said, God fed a man with a raven. Yes. And if He can feed a man with a raven, He will take care of His own. We might have to go through some stuff. Amen. We may subject, be subjected some, to some things, but we have a protector. Amen. He will protect us. Amen. Amen. The terror by night. We don't have to be afraid. There's so many people that have so much, even Christians, that have so much fear. <coughs> Perfect love casts out fear. So many times recently when I've had to pray for someone with cancer or things like that that are very uh, imminent of death, I pray against fear. Yes. Because fear, when when my dad, I found out, we'd just taken the church in El Mirage. I was not quite 30 yet. I was young. had four little kids. And, well, 12 on down to two. And uh, they called me and said, Dad has cancer. Well, you know what? That was many years ago, and it's like death sentence. Mm -hmm. It was just like a death sentence. <clears throat> but we don't have... Someone was talking about peace that they had. Was it little Marilyn here? The peace that she had? Mm -hmm. And I, rela I related because I had a lump in my breast, and they were going to take it out. And if it was malignant, they were going to remove, do a, mat a you know, radical thing. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so the two ladies came in the night before to sign this thing, and they said, well, do you know what you're signing? I said, yeah, well, tell us. I said, well, you're going to go in, and they're going to take the lump out, and if it's malignant, they're going to do a radical surgery. Well, you do know, so signed it. The next morning, that's when, you know, they put you in early, so you didn't have to, you know, they could give you some comfort and all that. And my mother was down. Our son came, but he wouldn't even come into the hospital at that time. He was not saved. And uh, that morning, before they took me down, I felt like Jesus was standing right there, peace personified. I have never had that kind of peace before or after. You see, God doesn't have to waste His resources. No. You know, some people, well, they want to be anointed and then they'll go do No, no, no. You step out. Yeah. Yeah. I was saying this to one of our ladies yesterday. The will of God will never take you or lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Yeah. And so, uh, even when I, like I said, when I answered the call to preach, I'm like, oh, what have I done? Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm a person of commitment. I called the district the next day and said, I want to get credentials. And that was the beginning. At that time, I think I was about maybe 25. I don't remember when I started that. But I was saved about five years before when I was 25. And I'd done everything in the church just about, you know, because it was a small church and they need everybody. The first thing they did is handed me a quarterly. We need a beginner teacher. I didn't know Genesis and Revelation, you know. <laughs> but I learned all the little Bible stories. I learned how to make peat boxes and flannel grouts and all of that, you know. And, and then I taught the teenagers and I led the worship. And, you know, you just grow. You just grow if, if you'll be committed. Yes. Yeah. And don't let fear hold you back. The first time I sung, we had a couple over that were farmers out where we were farmers. We lived out there. So my dad had been fishing. We had a fish fry and we invited Eel and Lavella over. And so we always sung, even before we got saved in church. We were singers. My dad was a singer. He was in a quartet in Fort Worth before we moved to West Texas. And he led the choir in this big old church that they attended, helped build in Fort Worth, Riverside Tabernacle. And so we'd always sing. So this guy goes right to the pastor. You gotta have Shirley sing because she can sing. So I borrowed my brother-in-law's guitar, his little electric guitar, and the only song my husband had taught me to chord on the guitar before we ever got married because we had little dances at this schoolhouse that was turned into a community center, and his family did the music for it. He played the rhythm guitar. They had one that played the mandolin, one that played the fiddle. So they did the music for the dances. And so I had him, I wanted to learn. I wanted to play the guitar. I wanted to play anything. I mean, you know, name it. So 
course, I loved it. He put his arm around me and showed me. <laughs> <laughs> I like good stuff. So I knew how to chord a little bit in the key of A. That was the easiest one. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know this song was more for a funeral. <laughs> it's the only one I thought I could sing and play the guitar myself because he wasn't in church yet. So the first two verses, I mean, my knees were knocking. I kid you not. I, was, I couldn't hardly get it out. I couldn't get my breath. And finally, on the third verse, I was able to do better, you know, because I got settled down. And it was, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. <laughs> but I did it. And that was the beginning. <laughs> Hallelujah. But uh, fear, I mean, fear will drive you insane. It drives people insane. There's no place for fear because he says here, don't be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day. Those fiery darts of the wicked. You know, that's where he hits us. Somebody looks at us wrong. I wonder what I did. What's wrong? You know, we're questioning ourselves. None of that. A thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Can we stand in that and realize that no matter what, my husband with his issue that he had, you know, I never did fear that he was going to die. And those of you, of our people that saw him, didn't know if he was going to make it. He got AFib, his blood pressure was going up and down. He had three blood clots from the IVs they put in it. He looked bad. He looked bad. But God. Yes. The church was praying. A lot of people were praying. And he's on his feet. The heart doctor told him the other day he could drive. I said, well, we forgot to ask his primary care doctor if he could drive. Could he? Can you give him okay to drive? Because he wanted to drive. Oh, he can drive, he said. You don't need to come back and see me only if you want to come and see me. <laughs> I said, not really. <laughs> but because he gives his angels yes, charge over Amen. us. You see, sometimes we don't even know how he's intervened and he's, he sent his angels. Listen, we don't know. But be aware, and there was a whole book on angels. Who wrote that? Was it Billy Graham? Billy Graham did that. Yes, yeah, and I read that years ago. The, the ministering angels for the heirs of salvation. We have them. Yes. We don't pray to them. We pray to Jesus and He dispatches yes. the angels. But just rest assured, there's many times that He has saved us when we didn't even know it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Get on the highway, honey. Coming up here, I get angry at stupid drivers. <laughs> I, do. I just get so upset. You idiot. <laughs> Somebody got under conviction because they said that the Lord told them, well, that's my child. I said, well, an idiot's an idiot. <laughs> That's the way I feel about it. They're not only endangering their own lives, but other people's lives. Oh, yes. They whip in front of you. Yeah. I don't care. You're going the speed limit. They got to beat it. I said, if the speed limit was 90 miles an hour, they'd have to go 100. Yeah. They've got to beat it. And then you catch up with them at the light. Yeah. And I want to say, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I'm afraid to. This road rage. I won't do it, but I really want to. You didn't get very far. <laughs> but we do have angels watching over us. Just remember that, ladies. No matter what you're going through, all that time he was in the hospital, I was at home by myself, but there was no fear. There was peace. Peace, peace, peace. And love cast out fear. Hallelujah. Verse 13, you shall tread upon the lion and the adder. I think somebody said the cobra in their translation. Mm -hmm. Don't mind, it's just a snake. <laughs> <laughs> the young lion and the dragon shall you trample under feet. We have power. Yes. I said we have yes, power with God. Yes. Not on our own. He's our, he fights our battles. If we trust Him. This whole song could lead us to trust Him. Yes. Trust Him with your life. Yes. Even at the point of death. 
Mm. Trust Him with your life. Yes. Amen. Because He's trust. How many of us have proven that? Yeah. How trustworthy yes. He is. Yes. When things look so bad. Mm. Here He comes. So we have power. Don't be afraid to use that power. Amen. You know, there's people, I used to, people ask me to pray for them and I, I intended to. But then I'd forget. We had a man in Wilcox before we ever left Wilcox after we were in church and he knew it. I think he went to the Methodist church and he was the sponsor of my husband's baseball team or softball team he was on. He said, I want you and Johnny to pray for me because I want to quit cigarettes. Well, I really had every intention, but I didn't remember it. So we met up with him a month or so later. Well, thank you. I bought all those cigarettes. I didn't tell him that I forgot about it. Oh, well, somebody prayed for me. Yes, yes. Amen. But after that, I thought, somebody asked me to pray for them. I'm not going to say I will. I'm going to say, let's do it right now. Yes, yes. You don't have to get loud. You don't have to make a spectacle. But if you just pray in the name of Jesus, yes. God hears and he answers prayer. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. So we have power. Ladies, we have power. Yes. You know, the Bible talks about us being the weaker vessel. That's only in the physical. You know, but we have power with God as ladies. We're the ones that really get close to the heart of God. We'd have all night prayer meetings at our churches, El Mirage and Lighthouse. Remember in El Mirage, we'd bed all the kids down in the back. The men and the women would be there. Well, the women would just be praying up a storm. The men are laying in the back asleep. <laughs> they can't persevere like we can. We know what perseverance is. Just have one baby. Yes, <laughs> and you know what you know what perseverance is. And I had four of them. I said when I had my son, he was my firstborn. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, I'm begging my husband, let's have another baby. He was reluctant, but I pursued it until he, we had another baby. Three girls after our son. After the third girl, I said, I give up. I'm never going to have another son. <laughs> <laughs> we know how to persevere. Yes. We have the patience. Remember the times, all of you that have children, that you've said in the doctor's office, and then they put you in this room, and you have to keep your child entertained yes. and out of things, <laughs> waiting for the doctor to get in there. Yes. I mean, it's one thing to do it when you're an adult. I was just there uh, Wednesday, you know. They put you in that room. Why don't you just leave me out? There till you get ready to see me. At least I'll be around people. <laughs> oh, we learn patience. You know, when my younger sister, she was so sick growing up, and mother would stay up all night with her. And I, one night I decided, because I felt sorry for my mother, I'm going to stay up with her with Sharon. And I was just a kid. And I did. I sat up, but in a little bit, here's the way my sister was breathing, her sort of not tonsils. <laughs> I saw what she sounded like. Every breath. Finally, I looked at my mother and I said, Mama, I can't do it. And so I went to bed. And I used to wonder, how could my mama do that? Well, our youngest baby, she was three months old, uh, got sick. She was choking. We were going to bed one night, and I told my husband, the other kids had had the flu. I said, Johnny, this baby is choking. And he's just getting ready for bed. You know men, they don't get flustered about, he doesn't get flustered about anything. I told him one time, honey, I'm the only stress that you have. <laughs> and that's the truth. But anyway, I don't know if you want to put this on, in, on anything. <laughs> I said, well, you can go to bed if you want to, but I'm going to the emergency room. And we lived in Wilcox. It was a small town. So I took him, and they put him in, put her in the hospital. Three days, she had five penicillin shots. I think that's what happened to her body, because her body started turning on itself, killing the glands in her body. And so she's a diabetic and all that. But when she was three months old, and in the hospital, they'd have to bring, i call her for the nurse. I stayed with her. It's a good thing because I think she would have choked to death. I'd call for the nurse. She'd start choking. And she'd come in and suck the mucus out of her throat. 
So after three days, I took her home. And for two or three days, I was up day and night. Yeah. I found out what mamas can do yeah. when they have to. Exactly. And I'd be, I'd be over her front. I said, well, I've got to get a little bit of sleep. I wouldn't trust my husband with her. I wouldn't trust anyone with her, you know, to take care of her in that condition because she was still doing it. But I learned how to do it. And I would be over her crib and wake up over her crib because I would hear her and take care of her. So one day, we were talking about going to a fellow. How many remember fellowship meetings? Yeah. Weren't they wonderful? Yeah. We were going to a fellowship meeting. We was talking about it. We still farming. But we lived in town then, and he, the farm was out 16 miles out in the Kansas settlement. And uh, so we talked about it. Then we decided we wouldn't. Well, he was outside getting ready to leave, and... And Cindy's in her little crib in our bedroom. And uh, I didn't know then you could have separate rooms for your babies. You know, they were, in, they were all in the bedroom with me in their crib. And uh, we, we had taken her to Tucson to a specialist. And he said, well, he just called it allergies or something. Said it could turn into asthma and whatever. I had this bottle of antihistamine that I was giving her. I didn't see it working. I said, I still... Isn't it amazing how you can remember things in your mind's eye? Yes. I just set that bottle on the back of a dresser. And I said, God, I know you love her more than I do. I didn't pray no great Holy Ghost prayer. I just said, I know you love her more than I do, and I'm at my wit's end. You're going to have to take over. Why does it take us so long? <laughs> so... I go outside, and Johnny's having problems getting his pickup started. I said, let's go to the fellowship meeting. So we did. San Manuel. Well, that day, I had a navy blue dress. Remember those polyester dresses we used to make? Had the one that had, and almost every lady in the church had one of them, you know. <laughs> Lutheric pattern or simplicity. Or all those. And I had navy blue. And I had given her a bottle. She started coughing, and just all down the front of me. This is a little lady. She's got the hooping cough. I said, no, she's been to the specialist. They've checked her. She doesn't have a whooping cough. But that was the last choking spell yes. she had. Amen. Amen. But in later years, and I believe it's from the penicillin shots, her body turned on itself, killing the glands of her body. Mm -hmm. Killed her pancreas, killed her adrenal glands. And she has a lot of problems she's facing back surgery right now that we don't really want her to have, but the doctor said you're going to have to have it. But we have power. Yes. And once you know that you've released that thing to God, there's a peace, an assurance, a calm. I could tell you about my husband in his rheumatoid arthritis, but I won't take I don't even know how much time I've got. But let's go on to verse 14. Because He has set His love upon me. How many of you have set your love Amen. upon Jesus? Amen. Have you really? Amen. Therefore will I deliver Him and I will set Him on high because He has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer Him. I will be with Him in trouble I will deliver him and honor him. Yes, With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Hallelujah. My husband is over 88 years old now. This is the only... Well, he's had some other things happen that God has brought him through. But we, the girls and I have realized if he hadn't been as healthy as he was, he might not have made it through that. But, and I'm 81, still preaching when I can <laughs> and uh, last August I broke I told you about that didn't I yeah. Yeah. my foot surgery and then this episode with him but of course Job said though God slayed me we know it wasn't God yeah. that slayed Joseph, uh, Job Job I mean Job <laughs> <sighs> the promises these promises we have a position in Him. We have power with Him. And we have promises. Yes. Amen. He's promised us a long life. 64 years with one man. 
That's a long time. I don't remember not being married to Terry. I was just a child bride, really. He used to get up and say, well, you know, they say you marry him young. He was 24, I was 17, already been overseas in Korea. Uh, you marry him young, you can raise them up the way you want them. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> but then I got to sing. Well, you know, I've heard a saying too, that you're an old man's darling and you're a young man's slave. What happened to that? I've slaved all my life. <laughs> well, we've had a, we've had well, we've had ups and downs. Yes. You know, I had a lady one time. Me and my husband, we never had a conflict, oh. and he ended up with another woman. Oh, I thought, well, honey, you should have had a few conflicts. <laughs> <laughs> they can make you or break you, mm -hmm. but you know, when you're living for Jesus. And you want to live for God. And you don't want to lose out with God, honey. You can put up with a lot. Yes. I was preaching three years in a row. I preached the Pentecost Church of God Women's Retreat here. There, wherever we're at. <laughs> here, there, or somewhere. And uh, one night I was preaching. I was preaching on, I don't know what, but I was talking about 20 years of marriage is the danger, one of the danger years. Seven, they say, and 20. And I made a statement I've never said behind the pulpit. I said, don't get a divorce. Just duke it out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've been through some deep waters. You can't be married as long as we've been married and raise four children in the ministry and not have some difficulties. I remember one time telling him, you know, we were pastoring and I'm the preacher. And I said, honey, we didn't know it would come to this. I said, we just grew in the Lord and here we are. You know, here we are. Because it sometimes got difficult, especially in our younger years, you know. Try to raise four kids, preaching. And then my dad, he got cancer, and they brought him down to Phoenix for operation. Four weeks he was in the hospital because they thought my brother had hepatitis, which he didn't, but they had to wait, make sure he didn't before they'd operate on my dad. Mm -hmm. I went every day to the hospital. It was on Indian school, Phoenix yeah. hospital. It was on oh, Indian, yeah. Indian school and something. Yeah. My dad would call in the morning, well, now, Shirley, I'm not rushing you. I don't want you to, you know, come in. I just want to see what y'all are doing. Every day I went to that hospital. And I learned something. You know, you get on-the-job training sometimes. <laughs> because I, the one I, thing I feared the most was that, going to hospitals. Mm -hmm. Now, funerals, that was a little scary, but at a hospital, you're just not sure what to say. You go visit somebody. So God gave me on-the-job training, four weeks. One week, when Dad had surgery, my mother came down with strep infection. So she was in the bed that whole week. And I'm taking care of four children, pastoring a church, all that. And I think at that time, Johnny wasn't even there with me. He traveled from Wilcox to El Mirage from March until he laid the crops back that fall. And uh, so I had it all to myself. And uh, it, was, it was such a training period because I found out it's not what people say. It's the fact that they're just there. Yeah. Yes. You know, what can you say, you know? But Dad got through that and, and was up and around for a long time, but finally it was bone cancer. Got in all of his bones and... Mm -hmm. and uh, when he was very bad, my, I was praying for him, and my brother said, Now, Shirley, you, you girls have got to realize Daddy's dying. I said, I'm going to tell you something. As long as my Daddy tells me to pray for him, I'm going to pray for him. Amen. I understand. I'm not in the dark, you know. But I would pray for Daddy. And he'd say, well, I think it's Shirley's just my arthritis. I think God just won't. I said, well, Okay, Dad. Why am I going to pray for you? God gives it to you. I'll just let you have it. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. But we have a God Amen. that's the God of the impossible, but He needs us to cooperate with Him. We hold the key to what our lives are going to be. If we commit ourselves and make that total surrender. We had a little old lady in our church in Elmer. She little tiny thing. 
And she said, she tell the young people, young people, you just have to make that, say that one eternal yes to God. Every time she testified, she'd say that. So true. She had this big old, I have to tell you, this Plymouth car. She painted it twice with a brush. <laughs> and it didn't look so bad. The last one she did, the cat ran across it and she got upset. <laughs> well, it was wet. <laughs> but here she was, she's a little tiny thing. You can barely see her head over the steering wheel. And she'd sit up in church and testify how God kept her on the road. And we'd all want to say, Amen! <laughs> because he did, he did, he did, he did. Stories. You talk about stories. We've all got so many stories. Yeah, we do. Different ones that told me to write a book. And I tried, I started a couple of times, but I get too in depth. I just get lost in it. I want to go, I want to tell everything from the time I was born. God loves us. Yes. Now the Bible says with an everlasting love. This man that just came back to God was deep in sin. But I say this, God, Holy Ghost, that hound of heaven will follow you to the brink of hell. Hell was not prepared for people. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. So I don't care. Really, it was not my faith that brought, although we kept in touch over the years, it, I don't believe it was my faith that got them back in church. But I said, if our ministry that we have right now doesn't do anything else than that, it's worth it all. Amen. 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 So ladies, be encouraged. Amen. Encourage one another. Mm -hmm. You know, we just have this one life to live. Live it to the fullest. Amen. Don't let what you have with God drain out. Amen. Cultivate it. Amen. Being a farmer's wife, I know about cultivation and planting seeds and all of that. So just be encouraged in the Lord today. And and I don't know what's on the program. I'm willing to pray with anyone that might need prayer this morning. I talked to someone a while ago, and I said, you know what I said from the pulpit? Hurts, heartaches, they're here. That's right. They're here. Yeah. They're here. Mm -hmm. But I believe that God can do something about it. If I'm, I'm available, it's up to you, Sister Betty, whatever you want yes, to do. We have God. Yes. Hallelujah. So because I felt that from the beginning, that, you know, we're not just here to mark time. No. We want to see whatever needs to be done Amen. to be done. And if you have a need, the Bible says that you can call for the elders of the church. I'm not Nancy. It's okay. Now, I believe in laying on of hands. I do too. Hallelujah. Amen. Ladies, Amen. I want you involved in this. Stretch your hands toward Amen. my sister Betty. Hallelujah. I'm sure they're probably not real young. Some of these, the reaching ages that they need to make a decision. They need to get their hearts right with God. Father, right now we stand together with sister Betty for her family. God, Sharon, no, no, Shirley and Nancy. And their family is God. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I pray, Father, that many will be encouraged today, God, to know that every time they pray, every time she prays, that you're hearing her. And God, bring them into the kingdom. In the name of Jesus, give her wisdom, God. If she has a chance to say something and speak something into their lives, God, that you will anoint it by your Spirit, Lord, let it penetrate their hearts and their lives. In the name of Jesus. God, you're not willing.
willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Father, you said we are a royal priesthood. And that means that we can stand before your throne in, in proxy for someone else, God, pleading for their souls. God, that not a one of them will be lost. In Jesus' name. Now let's thank Him for it. Hallelujah. 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 Ooh, hallelujah. Let, me, let me interject something here. Now, from the charismatic movement on, we become a clapping people. Now, there is a place for clapping. But Hebrews tells us that we are to give Him the fruit of our lips, giving praise. So there's a time to clap, but then there's a time to just offer it out of your mouth. He inhabits the praises of His people. You didn't know He was going to have a Bible study. Somebody else, anything you need? Come on down. No, surely I have a question for, oh, okay. the, for the women of this last generation. In this world that we live in now, as a leader and over women, what would you not just suggest that from the Spirit of the Lord, what would you say to us women as to what our focus should be in these last days with our families, with the political issues, everything around us that affects our family? What would you suggest that we focus on? Well, you know what I was said I was going to talk about was not settling. Um, our greatest weapon, I was just talking to someone, I don't remember now who it was. Oh, it was my sister in Wilcox, her, her kids, her sons. They've never surrendered to God, and he's in like fourth woman. He don't even marry him now. Mm -hmm. And she's so concerned. I said, Helen, the greatest weapon that you've got is prayer. prayer. Yes. I say, yes. Sister Charlotte, we need some intercessors. Amen. I looked for a man. You could say woman to make up the hedge and fill in the gap, but I found none. I wonder, he said, that there was no intercessor. I think the greatest, and, and I've talked to our group the other night at our prayer meeting in our home on Tuesday night about intercessory prayer. Uh, I don't know that it's a calling. I don't, everybody doesn't do it. And I told them, no matter how you pray, God listens yes. and he answers prayer, but we need some intercessors. Amen. Now, Ladies know how to do that. Yeah. It's like having a baby. When, when those groanings hit you, when it's coming from your innermost being, yeah. and it, it's you don't know what it's about. But I say, you know, to grandparents, if your children, if you can somehow speak into your children's children, if they're not living for God, do everything you can to affect those grandchildren. Take them to church. Have as much time with them as you can if their parents are not doing it. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, really, our greatest weapon is prayer. Actually, uh, because what's coming on the world, and I see, I mean, I, I got a, an ounce with my grandson. I mean, I think it's okay now, but these tattoos. Oh, yes. I hate these tattoos. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even saying a spiritual thing. They just, these ladies, I mean, I've seen them totally covered mm -hmm. with tattoos. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a fad. And I also say this I believe that this gay stuff mm -hmm. has become a fad yeah. mm -hmm. for these kids. Yeah. I think it's a fad. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what love is. Mm -hmm. Some of them aren't even old enough to know whether they like a boy or not, mm -hmm. or a girl. It's a fad. Oh, I think that would be swell. One of them, somebody I know very close, one of his twin girls, declared she was gay. Mm -hmm. So she was just a kid. And they, her daddy put on the face, oh, I'm so proud of you. Oh, oh my God. Well, it's like, see, here's what's happened in the church. We have focused on youth. Everything is about the youth. All the music is about the youth. And one year, Brother Harris said, well, the ages that we need to focus on are the 20s and 30-year-olds because they're leaving our churches. Why? Yeah. I want to say to him, but I've never had the opportunity, 
if all the music that's geared to these young people, the louder the better, is doing it, why are they leaving our churches? We've got to get them in the Word of God, and we've got to get them full of the Holy Ghost. What I see manifested is not the Spirit. It's just emotions, a lot of it in the flesh. We've got, and now preachers are preaching. You don't have to speak in tongues. I know. To be baptized in the Holy Ghost. So why do we have so much stuff going on in our church? I've told, I'll say this. I'll stop saying what I told my congregation. It don't matter. <laughs> if the Holy Ghost is not moving in the church, conviction will not be there. The Word alone will not, it takes the Word and the Spirit because the Spirit is the sword of the, how's it say? Of the Word. The sword is the sword. Somebody help me. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. I knew I'd get it sooner or later. I'm worth waiting on. <laughs> Hallelujah. We need the Holy Ghost. I, they told me to go get somebody, another church, to oversee us, and and. They don't know what to do with me, so they just left me out to pasture. That's okay. You know, I don't care. And, uh, so I went to this church, this church, and this pastor who was over the outreach, and he had, he was Baptist, and I don't think he had the Holy Ghost. I should have asked him, but I didn't. And they put him in as their outreach pastor, because Baptists, they know how to reach people. And so he said, well, we want revival in our church. Our pastor's teaching, because they're not ready for it. Like you can teach revival? I mean, give your rage. <laughs> Honey, get on your knees. If you want revival. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I, he said, you know, because we don't want any of that silly stuff. <laughs> I looked at him. I know I might have pointed my finger at him. I'm not real sure about that. But I said, I'm going to tell you something. I probably did. I've seen the good. I've seen the bad. And I've seen the ugly. But I know what works. Yes, These two amen. young girls. Oh, well, they're not young now. These two ladies. They were in our church Thursday night. Both got saved at Lighthouse out of very much sinful life. But the Holy Ghost yes. and the preaching of the Word yes. got a hold of them. Amen. And they're still living for God. One of them has suffered from the re uh, results of cancer since her little boys were this high. And they're grown now. She's still battling. Mm -hmm. But she's... I mean, I would go see her and she would... I'd be more lifted up than I could lift her up, going through chemo and all of that. It works. It works. But you've got to get the whole thing. It's not one or the other. It's the Word. It's the Spirit. It's both of them together. Yes. Hallelujah. And a lot of times they're just entertaining our kids. Amen. My daughter and her husband was our children's pastors for a long time at Lighthouse. And the first thing she told her daddy, Daddy, I want you to build me an altar. For children's yes. church. One lady called her one day and she said, I don't know what you're doing for my son, but he can pray like an adult. Amen. <laughs> but is there any other one, people that, I know there's probably some that you would like to have prayer to, yes? Well, my son, he's no kid, he's 50, and he doesn't know the Lord. Well, come here, I gotta touch you, come on. Come on. <clears throat> Don't start something you can't finish. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many believe in this? How many believe in just really agreeing together in prayer? Yes. Yes. And binding together. Yes. And I pray every day that well, sure you do. the seed would be planted, that it be watered. And he, not one, but two that work with him. But they're Jehovah Witnesses are, mm -hmm. who are witnessing to him now. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to pray God put a hedge up. Yes. Pull a wall of fire. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. What's his name? Richard. Richard. Father. Amen. In the name of Jesus, this boy, God, this mother's heart, God, I relate to this brokenness over this son. Father, she has planted word. Have you planted the Word of God in his heart somewhere? So he knows. See, the seeds are already there. So we have to ask God, let it come to fruition. Father, in the name of Jesus, and we bind any influence that these Jehovah's Witnesses have over him in the name of Jesus. 
God, it's a man-made religion. And we bind it in the name of Jesus from off of his life. Father God, we pray that the Holy Ghost will begin to deal with that boy in the wee hours of the night, God. <laughs> when nobody is around God and he's alone, Holy Spirit, bring conviction to his heart. In Jesus' name, God, whatever it takes, show him his need of a Savior. In the name of Jesus, save Richard to the uttermost. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All right, God, he needs a wife. He needs a wife. All right, God. Oh, God bless you, son. Hallelujah. The last way I prayed for my son was, God, show him and his wife before she passed away their need of a Savior. And he called me one day, 31 years old, Mom, they think I've had a heart attack. So Johnny and I rushed down to Wilcox. I didn't, I had got to where I couldn't say anymore. I just put it in God's hands because I had spoken to him so many times. And we went right down. He didn't, I didn't push him at that point in time. So we get back home. I told the people at Lighthouse, please pray for Gerald. I said, he's at the brink. But I want to be with him when it happens. So the next day he called me on Monday. He was waiting for a call from the specialist in Tucson. Because he, well, he wasn't satisfied with Wilcox's doctor, so he went to Tucson. He's waiting for a call. And finally I said, son, are you just ready to give it all over to God? Amen. He said, yes. Oh, I can't tell you the hours that I would pray for that boy. And the tears that I would shed because it was so hard. And I told the congregation the other night, I said, I've said it probably more than once, when I read the scripture, he's got all my tears in the bottle. Yes. You might pray like this. I'd say, God, take the lid off of my bottle of tears and pour them in Gerald's heart and soften his heart. Amen. And he did it. That's what he did. He said, I was so hard. So I prayed him through over the phone. Amen. I said, now you need to call Cindy. That's his little sister that I said has all these problems because she's interceded for her brother. I said, do you want me to call her? No, 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 I'll call her. So he called Cindy. She was living in Holbrook at that time. And I said, then you go to town and you tell Grandma what happened. So my mother called me later. Because I said, you need to confess this. She said, we'd laugh a while and we'd cry a while. We'd laugh a while, we'd cry a while. But I want you to know it's stuck. You know the first thing he started doing? Tithing. Tithing. And one day he's on the phone right after he got in church. Mom, I know that if I can work 10 hour days that these people could get to church. <laughs> and I'm just smiling in the phone. You know? <laughs> that's my boy. Because I said once he comes in, he's going to know. Yeah. See, that's what was so hard because he knew what was expected exactly. if he gave his heart to the Lord. Yeah. But I could go on and on and I don't need to do that. Anyone else? Yes, darling. Uh, uh, a lot of family. Well, this is sounds like this is turning into a, a, a need for families. Yes. I don't know, Charlotte, if I answered your question yes. that you had. I mean, I, to me, it's just yes. the greatest weapon that we have. Amen. Because they get to the point you can't talk to them. Right. That's right. You know, they don't want to hear it. That's right. And I pray, God, just put somebody in your Because I had a lot of young men in my church. And I said, I'm taking care of these young men. Send somebody. And he did. A, a guy uh, that worked with him. Rode, he rode every day out to work with him and he'd witness to him. You see, line upon line, precept upon precept. And he was raised in church, just like my girls, but they just came in real soon. Real, my youngest was filled with the Holy Ghost at five. You know, so that's the way it was. So yeah, it, I've come and I, to, I think, how many of you have lost children or grandchildren? Why don't you stand up and I want y'all just all to grab hands. And we're just going to make this a, a whole, what am I trying to say? A concert of prayer for families, grandchildren, children. Uh, and, and let's believe that as we're agreeing together in prayer, 
that the Holy Spirit is going to begin to move in these hearts. Because I have two grandsons out of all my grandchildren that aren't serving God. One is kind of breaking a little bit. I don't know about the other one yet, but in Jesus' name. Come and take my arm. I have an unbroken circle. Hallelujah. How many are really hungry to see your children and grandchildren say? Filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Gerald came to Lighthouse and he got filled with the Holy Ghost at Lighthouse. So I had a touch in all of that. Heavenly Father, one after another, God has talked about their loved children, loved ones, brothers, sisters. Father, we stand together as women of God, imploring you, Father, and bringing them to your throne of grace, that mercy seat, God. Have mercy, Father, upon these that are represented here, every one of them. And I want you right now to just begin to mention some names of the ones that you've been praying for. Just speak them right out loud in the name of Jesus. Whether it's Tom or Joe or whatever. The name of Jesus. As we're agreeing together, a mighty sweep of the Holy Ghost, we'll hear testimonies. My son got saved. My daughter got saved. And listen, if these daughters and sons will get saved, it can be passed on to their grandchildren. But sometimes God will go through the back way and touch a grandchild, which will bring the parents. But however, God, you want to do it, we just lay them before you and ask for your divine intervention in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Our God is able. Our God, He said He's not willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. God, we want to see true repentance. We want to see godly sorrow, Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Oh God, these relatives that we have, God, their children are sick. Oh God, bring them in before it's too late. Pray over our nation right now, God. Our president, God, that you will minister to him. I pray, God, that somehow you will give him. I know he has a tactic for him doing what he says and does. God, just let the things that comes out of his mouth be from you in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray over our nation that's so divided. God, there's so much going on. There's so much going on that, that we just look and we can't believe it with our own eyes. We just can't believe it. But God, we just bring to you this nation which was founded under God. Yes. In Jesus' name. And God, let the church rise up. Let the church be the church. God, that it needs to be blood-bought, pure and clean. Hallelujah. Glorious church without spot. In the name of Jesus. Holding high that blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ. Hold on my shoulders. God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, let God be truth in every man of life. In the name of Jesus. Let God be truth in every man of life. In the name of Jesus. Let's say hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
in this world methods change. May the word of God never be changed in our from our pulpits. Peach speaking the truth. <laughs> we had Brother Trask in our church here a while back. Preach for us. Our gen ex general yeah. superintendent. And he, he had a meeting with the 40 year olds. I don't know if you've heard about it, but they got a big thing going for the 40 year olds. I guess they're trying to rule the world. I don't know. <laughs> the church world. <laughs> He called them all together. He said, I'm not speaking. I want to hear from you. I want to hear what you've got to say. But he said, I told them before I, it all started, I'm going to tell you one thing. Do not touch the doctrine of the assemblies of God. And I know he was alluding to the speaking in tongues. He said, I had so many upset with me. Because they're just, they're turning away from me. And if we don't have the spirit, we don't have life. I don't care how many decisions you make. See, that was the thing with the Baptist church. You just make a decision. And now that's what we're doing in the assemblies of God. I never thought the assemblies of God would get where we are today. But I'm one that's going to hold on to the old time religion. 